Good morning, dear students. Uh, my name is Farhan Mazar, and today is 13th March 2022. Right now, I am with the 11th Cambridge class, and the subject we are studying is Physics 5054. It's Cambridge O level uh, physics. Today, we have set our hearts to solve a theory paper, and we have selected May June 2015 two two paper. This paper two belongs from the zone two, or you can say it belongs from the variant two. In this video, in this session, we are going to attempt the section A of this paper. The section B of this paper we will solve in another session, in another video, and I will also upload this that in my YouTube channel. So uh, let's start uh, this paper. So on your screen, and the May June 2015 two two paper is showing up. This is theory paper, paper two. The time allowed is one hour forty five minutes, and we are going to attempt only the section A of this paper in this video. The apparatus shown in the figure one point one is used to measure the extension of a spring. So you can see this apparatus. It's a spring. With this, we have a vertical scale here. Here we have a hook. Uh, with that hook, I will we will uh, put masses, and due to the mass, the, there will be extension created in the spring. So we will note down what is the length of the spring by adding the weights. He says, explain how the mass causes a force on the spring. It's a one mark question. You see uh, why the mass will cause a force on the spring because the mass is uh, experiencing the gravitational pull of the earth. Due to that, the mass has weight and that weight is acting downward. So the spring will experience a downward force due to the mass, due to the weight of the mass. So let me show you my answer. So here we go. Mass has weight due to the gravitational attraction of the earth, which pulls it down. So that is our answer. So I uh, have a look at the marking scheme and here we go. The marking scheme, what does the marking scheme says? Weight pulls spring down and causes tension or force, force or pull of the gravity or mass is in the gravitational field. That's the marking scheme. Then he says the force on the spring is a vector quantity. State what is meant by a vector quantity. Vector quantities are those physical quantities which can be completely described by magnitude and direction. So let me show you my written answer. Those physical quantities which are completely described by magnitude and direction, they, those are known as vector quantities. So let's have a look at the marking scheme as direction. Okay, so that's the answer. Figure 1.2 shows a graph of length of the spring plotted against the force on the spring for forces between zero and 10 Newton. So here on the X axis, the length of the spring is shown, 0, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120, 140 centimeter. On the X axis, the force or the weight or the load is represented. Two Newton, four Newton, six Newton, eight Newton, 10, like this. He says state a formula that uh, state a formula that relates the unstretched length L naught of the spring, the stretched length L of the spring, and the extension E of the spring. You see, the formula is very simple. L is equals to L naught plus the extension. The formula is very simple. It's L equals to L naught plus the extension. Here, the L naught is the unstretched length. Unstretched length means that when there is no load on the spring, the length of the spring is called L naught unstretched length. Extension is how much is the extension for a certain load? Okay, so, uh, so the, have a look at the marking scheme. So that's, that's the formula. So our formula is right. 
Okay, so then the next question, he says, a mass produces a force of nine Newton on the spring. Determine the extension of the spring caused by this mass. Okay, so we will go to the graph. So the nine, here is the nine. So from here, I will go to the graph and then I will check how much is this. This is 76 centimeter. So L is 76 centimeter, the L naught is 40 centimeter. So the extension will be L minus L naught. So that will be 76 uh, minus 40 and that will be 36. So the extension is 36 centimeter. The formula for the extension is L minus L naught. Hopefully you understand this numerical letter. Let's have a look at the marking scheme. It says 36 centimeters, so our answer is right. Okay, so the next question coming up is, he says the limit of proportionality of the spring is reached when the force is 10 Newton. The spring is easier to stretch after the limit of proportionality. On the figure 1.2, continue to the line, continue the line to suggest how the length changes when the force is greater than 10 Newton. So we have after 10 Newton, the limit of this is the point. This point is the limit of proportionality. So after this, the graph will bend upward. So let me show you how I have drawn it. So you can see that this is how the bend, the graph will bend in the upward direction. So let's have a look at the marking scheme. Curve upwards after 10 Newton. So our answer is right. Okay. Figure 2.1 shows two engineers measuring the length of a wall made from the concrete. So the wall is two meter high, 15 meter long and 0 0.25 meter thick. The wall, this is the, 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 the weight of the wall is 180,000 Newton and the mass of the wall is 18,000 kg. The engineers measure the length of the wall in one single measurement. State the name of the measuring instrument they use. So the measuring instrument which can measure this much, 15 meter length is the measuring tape. So the instrument which we can use is measuring tape. Okay, so let's have a look at the marking scheme. Tape, tape is the answer. He says uh, the engineers state that the density of the concrete affects the pressure exerted by the wall on the ground, but the length of the wall does not affect this pressure. Define density. Density is mass per unit volume. And here we go. The density is mass per unit volume. Mass per unit volume is called density. Okay. So what's the next question there, okay. The two marks question, he says, calculate the density of the concrete, okay. So um, I know the width, I know the height, I know the length. So uh, I can find the volume of this uh, uh, wall and I know the mass of this wall. So you can find the density of the wall. The density of the wall is mass divided by volume. So that is the question. It's a two marks numerical. Okay, so on your screen, you can see the, first of all, I will calculate what's the volume. So volume will be length into width into height. So 0 0.25 multiply two, multiply 15, and that will be 7.5 meter cube. The mass is 18,000 kg. So the, you know, the formula for the density is mass divided by volume. Mass is 18,000 kg. The volume is 7.5 meter cube. So the density will be 2,400 kg per meter cube. So let's have a look at the marking scheme. Let's check the marking scheme. So that's the formula. So 2,400 kg per meter cube. Okay, the next question coming up. He says, calculate the pressure exerted by the wall on the ground. We know the weight of the wall. Uh, so the pressure, pressure of the uh, wall on the ground will be and the weight of the wall divided by the contact area of the wall with the ground. The contact area will be uh, 15 multiplied 0 
that will be the area in contact with the ground and we know the weight of the wall that is a 180,000 Newton. So very easily I can calculate the pressure of the wall on the ground. So let me show you. <clears throat> so the pressure will be force divided by area. So that will be 1800, uh, 180,000 Newton divided by the area. Area of contact is 15 into 0 0.25. So 48,000 Pascal is the answer. 48,000 Pascal. So let's have a look at the answers. 48,000 Pascal is the right answer, sir. Then he says, uh, without further calculation, explain why doubling the length of the wall does not change the pressure that the wall exerts on the ground. So try to understand this point. When you double the length of the wall, the weight of the wall will double. Okay, so the force downward will double. But when you double the length of the wall, the contact area of the wall with the ground will also double. Because uh, So uh, the force has doubled, the contact area also has doubled, the pressure is forced divided by area. If the force doubles and the contact area also doubles, so their ratio will remain unchanged. So let me show you my answer. When length of the wall is doubled, weight of the wall becomes double, contact area of the wall with the ground also doubles. So the pressure remains same because the pressure is weight divided by area. If the weight doubles, the contact area also doubles. So the pressure will remain unchanged. So here we go. Let's look at the marking scheme. He says length double, so both area and weight force is double, or area and force weight both is larger in proportion, or height and density is the same. So, so that was our answer. So we are done with the question number two. Two different kettles are used to heat water as shown in the figure 3.1. So we have electric kettle and we have gas burner, gas heated kettle. Data for the two kettles is shown in the figure 3.2. For electric kettle, the energy supplied to the kettle in one minute is 120,000 joules. And the thermal energy heat supplied by the cattle to the water in one minute is 95,000 joules. In the gas heated cattle, the energy is, uh, uh, the input energy is 130,000 joules. And the, uh, the, the, the heat transfer to the water in one minute is 90,000 joules. So, Calculate the efficiency of the electric cattle. So if you want to find out the uh, efficiency of the electric cattle, you know the efficiency, the formula for the efficiency of uh, any device is uh, useful in output energy divided by the total input energy multiply 100. So here the useful uh, output energy is the energy which is given to the water. So that will is 95, that is 95,000 joules. And the input energy is 120,000 joules and multiply it with 100. So let me show you how this efficiency is calculated. Okay, so the efficiency is useful energy output divided by the input energy multiply 100. So 95,000 divided by 120,000 multiply 100. So that will be 79%. 79% is the efficiency. So let's check the answer. 79,000. 79%, sorry. Okay, so the next question they are asking is calculate the useful power of the gas heated cattle. The power, it's providing 90,000 joules of energy in one minute. So the power, you know, formula for the power is uh, heat divided by time, energy divided by time, work done divided by time. So uh, 90,000 joules divided by 60 seconds, and that will give you 1,500 watt. 1,500 watt is the answer. 
Our answer is right. Question number three. Okay, so now we are going to the next question. He says both, he says both kettles contain the same mass of water at the same initial temperature. State and explain which kettle brings the water to boiling point first. You see, the, the amount of heat supplied to the water uh, in one minute is 95,000 joules by the electric kettle and 90,000 joules by the gas heated kettle. So clearly the electric kettle will bring the water to the boiling quickly because the, the, its power is larger, the amount of energy given to the water by the electric kettle is more as compared to the gas heated kettle. So that is the question. Our answer is, you can see the, our answer right now. So our answer is electric cattle will bring the water to the boiling point first because its useful energy output is higher. So that is our answer. So let's have a look at the marking scheme. More energy, heat per minute output into water supply and more power output, transfer heat energy faster at a faster rate. Okay, so now the C part is the boiling water produces steam at 100 degrees centigrade. State one difference between the molecules in the steam and the molecules in the boiling water. The molecules in the, between, in the, in the steam have higher uh, potential energy as compared to the molecules in the boiling water. Or you can say the molecules in the steam, they are, they, the distance between its molecules is quite large as compared to the distance between the molecules of the boiling water. You only have to write one difference. Let me show you what I have written, and then we will check the marking scheme. In steam, distance between molecules is much larger than the molecules in the boiling water. So let's have a look at the marking scheme. Steam molecules have more potential energy further apart, smaller force bonds between molecules have latent heat, more random arrangement. So you have to write only one of the differences. A metal can and a plastic bottle, both containing liquid are cooled by placing them in a jug of the melting ice as shown in the figure 4.1. So here we have a jug filled with the ice and we have put a plastic bottle and a can, both have some kind of liquid in them. So we are cooling them. The can and bottle both contains 330 gram of the same liquid at 15 degrees centigrade. The specific heat capacity of the liquid is 4.2 joules per gram per degree centigrade. Calculate the thermal energy released when 330 gram of the liquid at 15 degree centigrade cools to 22 degree centigrade. So here the uh, change in the temperature is taking place. So we want to find out how much is the heat energy, thermal energy release. The formula is heat is equals to mc delta theta. Heat is equals to mc delta theta, where m stands the mass, c stands for the specific heat capacity, and delta theta means the change in the temperature. So heat is equals to mc delta theta. 330 gram multiply 4.2 joules per gram per degree centigrade multiply. So change in temperature is 15 minus two, so that will be 13. So 330 multiply 4.2 multiply 13, and that will give you 18018 joules. So in two significant figures, it will be 18,000 joules. 18,000 joules is the answer, sir. So let's have a look at the marking scheme. 18,000 joule is the right answer, sir. He says when the water at zero degree centigrade is used in the jug instead of the melting ice, the cooling is slower. Explain why cooling is faster when using the melting ice in the jug rather than the water at the zero degree centigrade. You see, when you use the melting ice, first of all, the melting ice will absorb, uh, absorb uh, latent heat of fusion uh, from the can and the bottle, plastic bottle. And then the ice will melt and the ice will be at zero degrees centigrade. After that, the ice will absorb its uh, heat capacity from the bottle and the can and it will cool them. So you see in the case of the ice, it will first absorb the latent heat to melt itself. 
So the cooling, if you use the melting ice in the jug, it will have a faster cooling. It, it, it will cause faster cooling. Let me show you my written answer, and then we will check with it with the marking scheme. So here we go. Melting ice absorbs latent heat of fusion, and then it absorbs the heat capacity, so it cools faster. It cools faster means it cools the contents of the can and the plastic faster. Contents of the can and the plastic faster. So let's have a look at the marking scheme. He says, ice takes needs heat energy for the latent heat, one thing, which the uh, water at zero degree centigrade will not require. To melt uh, to water at zero degree centigrade changes state to break bonds for molecules to gain potential energy. So that's one mark for this, one of them. And then it says water in the jug initially at zero degree centigrade warms up or ice and melted water in jug. Stays at zero degree centigrade, stays cold, stays at constant temperature, gives larger temperature difference between liquid and the melting ice in the jug. So water in the jug initially at zero degree centigrade warms up or ice and melted water in jug. Stays at zero degree centigrade, stays cold, stays at constant temperature, gives larger temperature difference between liquid and the melting ice in the jug. The liquid in the metal can cools down faster than the liquid in the plastic bottle suggests why this happens. Because you see, the liquid which is in the can, the can is made of the metal and metal is a good conductor of heat. So through that metal can, the transfer of heat takes place, place faster. Plastic on the other hand is an insulator. So through the insulator, the plastic bottle, the transfer of heat do not take easily. At least it is slow. Metal is a good conductor of heat, whereas plastic is insulated through metal exchange of heat takes place faster. That's our answer. So let's 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 try check what the marking scheme says. Metal is a good conductor of heat, or metal can has lower heat capacity, allows opposite uh, statements for plastic. For example, plastic is an insulator of heat. Uh, Penalize wrong statements and physics, for example, liquid evaporates from can. Metal conduct temperature, convect heat better. Okay, you cannot write these words here, okay? So that was the question number four. When balloon is rubbed on here, the balloon becomes negatively charged. The balloon is shown in the figure 5.1. Explain how rubbing causes the balloon to become negatively charged. When you rub the balloon with your hair, due to the friction between the balloon and your hair, the electrons have uh, transferred from here to balloon. That's why the balloon has become negatively charged. Electrons has to have transferred from here to balloon during rubbing. That's why balloon became negatively charged. That's our answer. So let's have a look at the negative charge moves from here, person head to balloon. Electrons move from here, person head to the balloon. Okay, so that is our answer. Then he says, actually explain why the hair is pulled towards the balloon. You see, when the, when the balloon will become negatively charged, the hair will become positively charged. Now balloon is negative and the hairs are positive. So the, you know that the unlike charges, they attract each other. That's why the hair, they are attracted to the balloon. Okay. Here is my answer. Balloon is negatively charged. Here are positively charged. Opposite charges attract each other. That is the reason the hairs are attracted to the balloon. Here is positive at the ends. Opposite charges attract or positive and negative attract. Okay. Explain why it is important that balloon is made from an electric insulator, you see, because the balloon is an insulator. So the charge, which is negatively charged, created on the balloon, induced on the balloon. Uh, if it is not insulator, when you will touch with it with your hands, through your hands, through your body, the electrons will go into the ground and the balloon will be neutralized. 
so the charge will not be able to stay on the balloon <clears throat> charge is accumulated on one portion of the balloon if it is not insulated on touch of hand charge will neutralize because the electrons will go into the ground and the charge will be neutralized let me show you charges electrons do not flow away are not conducted to earth person stays on the balloon on insulator state one example where the static electricity is useful you see when we paint the cars we take the body of the car we connect it with the negative uh, terminal of a battery so the the body of the car becomes negative and we spray spray paint on it and the paint droplets they are positively charged so the coating of the paint is very smooth it is even and no paint is wasted we say the spray painting is done by using the static electricity let me show you my written answer spray paint is used using a static electricity to paint cars okay so let's have a look at the any sensible example for example photocopier electrostatic precipitator flow ash removal spray painting printing crop spraying lightning fixes nitrogen in atmosphere etc etc we only have to write one so we are going to the question number 6 and uh, figure 6.1 shows a simple ac generator so here we have two uh, magnets this coil is rotating clockwise and obviously the alternating current will be producing it and through the carbon brushes and these uh, slip rings uh, we will take the charge out we will take the current out the coil rotates and an alternating electromotive force emf is induced in the coil the figure 6.2 shows how the alternating emf varies with the time as the coil rotates so here on the y axis emf is represented on the x axis the time is represented and this sinusoidal wave shows that the alternating current is produced he says explain why an emf is induced you see when this coil is rotating when this coil is basically rotating clockwise it is cutting through the magnetic lines so when the coil rotate it cuts the magnetic lines and due to that the emf is induced in the coil so let me show you my written answer when coil rotate it cuts magnetic lines due to this emf is induced in the coil okay so the mention of the magnetic field flux of north and south pole coil wire cuts the magnetic field flux and lines of magnetic flux in the coil changes that's why the emf is induced okay so let's move to the next part he says why the emf is sometimes positive and sometimes negative try to understand this this wording when this coil rotates for example if you take this side of the coil it will go it will cut the magnetic lines by going downward and when it this this side of the coil will be here it will cut the magnetic lines by coming upward so when it goes it cuts the magnetic lines by going downward the emf induced has a different direction and when that same side cuts the magnetic lines uh, by coming upward the emf induced will have opposite direction so the emf induced has during the half cycle has a different direction and in the next half cycle of the rotation of the coil the emf induced has a different direction opposite direction that's why we say an alternating uh, sometimes is positive sometimes it's negative alternating current is produced so let me show you my my written answer i have tried to write this answer during rotation so one side of the coil cuts the magnetic field lines by moving upward and then it cuts the magnetic lines by moving downward you see so that's why the current produced or the emf induced has uh, in one half cycle it is positive in the next half cycle the emf is negative so let's have a look at the marking scheme it says one side of the coil cuts one way and then the other or side moves one way and then the other returns or flux increases and then decreases 
Our answer is right. Changes are made to the AC generator one at a time. Stronger magnets are used, more turns are wound on the coil. The coil is turned faster. Complete the table figure 6.3 to show that what happens to the maximum value of the EMF and to the frequency of the alternating EMF. So here are the here's table is given. So the change is made and the stronger magnets. Uh, so when you use stronger magnets, what happens to the maximum value of the EMF? The EMF will increase. What happens to the frequency? Nothing will happen. It will remain unchanged. More turns of the coil and the EMF will increase, but nothing will happen to the frequency. It will remain unchanged. The coil is turned faster when you move the rotate the coil faster. Uh, the EMF induced will increase and the frequency will also increase. Let me show you. I have completed that table. You see, uh, when you use a strong magnets, the EMF will increase, but the frequency will remain unchanged. When you use more turns of the coil, the EMF induced will increase, but there will be no change in the frequency. And when you rotate the coil faster, the EMF will increase and the frequency will also increase. Let me show you the marking scheme. So this is the marking scheme showing up B part. I hope you can read it. Okay, so we are going to the next question. The next question is question number seven. An electric hair dryer and an electric heater are connected to the mains supply as shown in the figure 7.1. The cable from the heater to the main supply has a live, a neutral, and an earth wire. State the purpose of the neutral wire. The purpose of the neutral wire is to take the, uh, the current which is at the zero voltage back to the main supply. That's the purpose of the neutral wire. Let me show you my written answer. Uh, the neutral wire takes the current at zero voltage back to the main supply. To provide a complete circuit with live to pass current back to the main or provide a return path for the current, okay. The live wire in the electric heater touches the outer metal case. Explain how the earth and fuse together protect the user from the electric shock. You see, uh, in the electric heater, if the live wire comes in contact with the metal case and you have connected a earth wire or a ground wire with the metal case, so through that earth wire or the ground wire, the current will start going into the ground. So the current coming from the main supply will increase when the current coming from the main supply will increase the fuel which you have installed in the live wire it will become hot and it will blow and it will cut the uh, supply of the live current to the electric heater and your electric heater will be isolated from the high voltage live current. So let me read you my answer which I wrote. Earth wire takes live current from the outer metal case to the ground supply of the current from the main supply increases. Fuse in the live wire becomes hot and blows. It isolates heater from the live current. So let's have a look at the marking scheme. Uh, current charge electron flows to the earth. Earth wire ground when live touches the case. Fuse melts, blows, and disconnects the circuit, cuts live, and stops current. Okay. Uh, the hair dryer does not have an earth wire. Explain why this hair dryer is still safe to you. You see, the, the body of the hair dryer is made of the plastic. We call this double insulation because the hair dryer has double insulation, means its body is made of plastic. So there is no need for the earth wire. Let me read you my answer. Hair dryer is double insulation. The hair dryer is double insulation. Hair dryer has double insulation. Its body is made of plastic. So no earth wire needed. Doubly insulated or case body made of plastic insulator, not made of metal or user cannot touch the metal. In some modern homes, circuit breakers are used instead of fuses. Suggest one advantage of using a circuit breaker 
rather than a fuse. You see, um, if there will be a surge in the current coming from the main supply, and uh, the circuit breaker, uh, if the current exceeds its rating, the circuit breaker will trip. And by just pressing a button, you can reset the circuit breaker. But in the case of the fuse, if the current exceeds the uh, rating of the fuse, the fuse will blow and you always have to buy a new fuse. So let me show you my answer. Oops. If current exceeds rating of the breaker, the breaker trips, which can be reset by pressing a button. That does not happen in the case of the fuse. You have to buy a new one. He says the circuit breakers turns off, acts faster, can be reset, easy to see. It has tripped or switched, can detect small difference between live and neutral currents or leakage current to the earth. You only have to write one of them. Okay, so we are moving to the next question. And the next question is question number 10. He says two isotopes of hydrogen are, uh, these are protium and deuterium, uh, hydrogen 1-1 and hydrogen 1-2. Complete the figure 8.1 to show the number of protons and neutrons in one nucleus of each of these isotopes. So here it will have one proton and zero neutrons. This one has one proton and one neutron. This is how you will complete the table. Let me show you my table. So here we go. I hope you understand. Let's have a look at the marking scheme. So our answers are right. Then he says, explain using ideas about the electrons, neutrons, and protons, why the atoms of hydrogen 1, 1, and hydrogen 1, 2 are uncharged. You see, in hydrogen 1, 1, there is one proton and there is one electron. So the, there is one positive charge and one negative charge. So the positive and the negative charge are balanced in this atom. So this atom will be neutral. In the same way, hydrogen 1, 2 has one electron, which is negative, one proton, which is positive, and one neutron, which is neutral. So in hydrogen, one, two, the negative and the positive charge, they are equal to each other. So they will balance each other. So the atom will be neutral. Let me show you my answer and then we will check this answer from the marking scheme. Here we go. Hydrogen one, one has one proton and one electron. So it's positive and negative charge are balanced. Hydrogen 1, 2 has one proton and one electron. Its positive and negative charges are balanced. So that's why they are neutral. Okay, so let's, oh, sorry. I have to check the marking scheme. At least one of the atoms contains a number of electrons and protons or have one electron and one proton charge on electron and proton opposite or electron and negative and proton positive or charge on electron neutralizes, cancels, balances proton charge Neutrons have no charge. I hope you understand. Okay, so, so my dear students, uh, by this question, we have reached the end of this section. Uh, I can show you. Now the section B is starting. So uh, my dear students, today we have done uh, May, June, 2015, uh, two, two paper. We have done section A of this paper. The section B of this paper, we will do in another video, in another session. So I hope that I have tried my best to explain you the concepts in a very quick way, all the concepts, all the calculations which have been used in this paper. My dear students, if you think, if you find this video informative, if you this, this video has made your physics past paper practice easier for you, please like this video. Also share the link of this video onto your Facebook accounts, onto your Instagram accounts, and onto your uh, Twitter accounts, because this will help me promote my channel. So. Um, and also uh, share the link of this video with your friends. So also uh, subscribe my channel and keep watching my videos. It's a great uh, blessing for me to be uh, helpful 
to many students around the world, especially the students who are watching my videos. I'm thankful to them because they are watching my videos, uh, especially students in Bangladesh and the students who are in Mauritius, the students who are in the Brunei, the students who are in UAE, the students who are watching my videos in, in, in Sri Lanka, the students who are watching my videos in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the, the students who are watching my videos in the UAE and, and many other countries, and especially the students who are watching my videos in Pakistan. So dear students, thank you very much for, for watching my videos. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day. God bless you all.